to be with you again on this warm and sunny morning. And uh, you know, there's people who are away for various reasons on holiday and uh, not very well. And uh, obviously, the inevitable uh, World Cup today. My uh, thing to me is I've got my Three Lions shirt on. I can't quite see it properly, but I've got lines over my shirt. So I'm, I'm doing my bit to support the team this morning while I stand here and bring forth God's word. Let's read the first three verses of Psalm 34, which uh, has a very significant meaning to me, which I'll tell you in a minute. But it is, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Now, those verses are significant to me because in 1985, as snow was falling outside the window, right there, I was baptised. I think by Bert Crump, and I don't think it was you, Malcolm. I, I, I was sorry, I don't know if you remember, but it was definitely Bert. And I think it may have been you, Malcolm, that you may contradict that. But that verse was given to me by your father, Doreen. <laughs> by Mr. Kirby. He gave me that verse in my baptismal card. <laughs> and then would you believe, many years later, my father was diagnosed with terminal cancer. And the first thing he said to the consultant was to quote from this verse, I will extol the Lord at all times. We can extol the Lord in good times and in bad. His praise should always be on our lips. So we're going to sing together our first song, which is Jesus is King and I will extol him. Concerned about in the coming week, that we would leave them all, Lord, 
with you this morning. And for the next hour or so, we will be able to focus on you. Focus on your love for us. Focus on worshipping you with our lips. And focus on listening to you and what you have to say to us this morning. Be with those that aren't here for various reasons, Father. Bless them too. But have your hand of blessing upon us each one today. In your precious name. Amen. If the children have been here, I'll give them a challenge, but I'm going to show you anyway because when I've done this before, people, it sticks in your memory. Is it possible to step through the centre of this piece of A4 paper? Yes. yes. It is. Do they know how to do it? <laughs> what things in the Christian life do we find difficult? What do we find difficult? Or do we find it all a walk in the park? Do we find doing a daily Bible reading difficult? Do we find praying every day difficult? Do we find difficulty preparing, finding time to pray every day? Do we find it difficult to love other people, especially if they don't love us? Do we find it difficult to go, do what God asks us to do? Sometimes we don't want to do it, do we? I've done that all the time. Do you know, I've done that, I've done that every Do you know, the trouble is, I've done it loads of times. And uh, the difficulty is that when you're talking, it's more difficult. It's when you're talking, it's more difficult. I know what I did, I turned the piece of paper around and just skipped into it. So we find it difficult to do what God wants us to do sometimes because we want to do our own thing, don't we? We find it difficult to love those that don't love us or in fact hate us. Perhaps we find it difficult to give a tithe because we want to keep the money ourselves. Perhaps you find it difficult to deal with sin in our lives because you know, we're enjoying it too much. All these things that seem impossible for us to overcome, don't they? It just almost seems impossible to live the way God wants us to. But nothing it's impossible for God. We forget, don't we, how powerful God is and how He can straighten out on us. Two of my favourite verses in the Bible, one is from uh, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 10, where talk, Paul talks about his weakness. He talks about how he is strong because of his weakness, because he relies on God, because he knows he is weak. He knows, therefore, that he's all the more strong because he is weak. You know, in, in the world, weakness is thought of as just that, isn't it? Weakness. But when we are weak in God, when we offer ourselves in weakness, he says, great, I can use you in my strength. So when God calls us to do something, he also equips us, and we can read about that in Ephesians 4, verse 12. He never calls us, he never puts something on our heart to do for him without actually equipping us to be able to do it. So if you feel God is calling you to do something, don't be afraid, because God will equip you to do it. Because nothing is impossible with God. And there you go. You can step through a piece of A4 paper. You know, we all think things are impossible, don't we? But it's only because we don't know how to do it. If we don't know how to do it, it seems impossible, but nothing is it possible for our Lord and Saviour and our God and King? We're going to sing again together. Our Lord God, nothing is impossible for them. <laughs> Thank you. 
morning, and this evening it will be my grandfather, Bob Warrett. Um, this week, uh, there is the prayer meeting at, at 7 p.m. at Mount Mandorin's house. Um, and, that's, and then next Sunday in the morning it will be my dad, Peter, and then uh, it's to be uh, arranged for the evening service, as far as I know, unless it has been arranged. I've not been told. Um, also during the week, uh, no, not during the week, uh, streets to pray for this week is your own street, and it, which is the same for the whole month of August. The UBC churches to remember in prayer are the, this one, Great Wakefront, Little Totten, South End, and South of the Hope. And the missionaries to remember in your prayers, oh, missionaries to remember in your prayers is the United Beach Missions and their work during the summer holidays, as well as the missionaries we support, Rachel and Jeremy Nash and Chad, and Tim and Susanna Gretchman in Uruguay. Um, I think that's everything on the notice sheet. One additional notice is that Daphne Latham's funeral is on Thursday at 3.20 p.m. at the crematorium. Um, yeah, that is the notices. I will pray for the offering. Dear Lord, thank you that we're able to come here tomorrow, this morning and, and have fellowship together. And then we're also able to give our money wherever it comes from and that I pray that it will be used wisely for the work in the church and the missionaries who support out in Chad and Uruguay and we know those places can be difficult so please also help the missionaries while they're out there and give them strength doing the work they do in what can be quite difficult circumstances. In your name, Amen. 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 Thank you. Well, we're going to sing again, this time the song, Open Our Eyes, Lord. Lovely uh, song to remind us to open our eyes to see Jesus and all that he means and reveals to us. <laughs> Necessary prayer this morning. Uh, I want to remember, as I'm sure many churches across the country will be this morning, those that have suffered at the hands of Lucy Letburn. I'm sure we've all been sad and if not horrified by the things that we might revealed over recent weeks during the trial, and then this week as the verdict was delivered. We cannot comprehend, can we, the amount of suffering of the families involved. And we're going to pray for them this morning. And we're also going to pray for the NHS staff that, that are no doubt traumatised by what has occurred and the fact that they tried to prevent it. And I'm sure it'll be in the news for many months to come as investigations continue. But we shall we just pray for all the people that have been affected by that situation? Our loving Heavenly Father, we know because of sin in the world that there is evil in the world, yet 
Sometimes we find it almost impossible to comprehend its nature. We find it almost impossible to understand how Lucy Letby could have undertaken the acts that she has. Obviously we know that she was not in sound mind, but rather we find it even so difficult to understand how one human being could wreak such evil on so many families. Father, this morning we would pray for all the families that continue to mourn the loss of their babies whose lives will be affected forever. Father, we pray for those who have had closure with the conviction this week that there are so many others that still do not know for certain how their babies died. Father, we would pray for all of the NHS workers impacted by this case. So many who try to raise concerns yet were ignored. Father, be a comfort to them. Father, as the investigations continue, we would pray that lessons would be learned to prevent the occurrence of this event again. Father, we would pray for those that are coming alongside those that mourn, counsellors and even Christian workers, we would pray for all Christians that are directly involved in that situation, that they would share your love and your light, even in this most cruel of situations that they face. Father, we pray for Lucy herself. We cannot understand what she's done, but Lord, we would pray that you would work in her life too. Nothing is impossible with you, Father. We can see through the Bible how you transform men and women who were against you into those who were for you. So, Lord our God, wrap your loving arms around the people involved in that situation. May there be good that comes out of this evil. In some way, may your name be glorified through the support that these people are given. In your precious name, we pray all these things. Amen. Before Tim brings our Bible reading to us this morning, we're going to sing one more time. This time we're going to sing, Lord, the light of your love is shining. We're going to be thinking a little bit about the light of the Lord in a short while. So let's sing together, number 445, Lord, the light of your love is shining.
Bible reading this morning is from John chapter 9. Uh, we're going to be looking at the whole of the chapter this morning, but it's quite long, so I've uh, provided him with an edited version, so if you're struggling to follow your Bible, it's because I've missed bits of it out. So Tim's going to come and read it to us. I encourage you during the week to read the whole chapter for yourself so you can get a full context uh, of the story, but I'm sure uh, the event will be uh, familiar to most of you. Thank you, John chapter 9. As he went along, he, that is Jesus, saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither his, this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. After they saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, you told him. Wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed, and he came home seeing. His neighbours and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, No, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes open in your eyes? He replied, The man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Silo and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man? they asked him. I don't know, he said. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, but he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. Then they turned again and a blind man, uh, to the blind man, what have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened, the man replied. He is a prophet. They still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son? they asked. Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? We know he is our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind. But how he can see now, or who opened his eyes, we, do, we don't know. Ask him, he is of age. He will speak for himself. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner, he replied. Whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know. I was blind, but now I sin. And they threw him out. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me, so that I may believe in him. Jesus, Jesus said, You have seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Thank you very much. That's um, really well read. Thank you. So as Jesus was walking along, he saw a blind man. The man was blind from birth. Here is one solitary human being, never seen the face of his parents or his friends, not knowing the beauty of a sunrise, blind from birth, this beggar. I'm guessing he was largely unnoticed by the crowd. But Jesus sees him as he passes by. Now this event uh, most probably took place in the vicinity of the temple, which Jesus had left at the end of chapter 8. The pool of Siloam would be close by. This blind man would have had few opportunities to support himself other than begging. And begging would have been most uh, profitable in a public area. And so he was here, close to the temple, where everybody was passing by in the hope 
of gaining an income so that he could support himself. Church, aren't we this morning born spiritually blind? Blind to God's mercy, grace and love. But the great news of the Gospel is that none of us are lost in the crowd when it comes to Jesus. Jesus sees each one of us. He knows each one of us. He knows where we're at. He knows what our need is. And just as he did with this blind man, he wants to come alongside us and give us spiritual sight. This is our hope. The disciples can't help but raise the inevitable theological question which would have raged at the time. Rabbi, who sinned this man or his parents that he was born blind? Now the disciples are children of Orthodox, Orthodox Judaism, which at the time believed that one's own sin was because of something or some, one's own troubles were because of your own personal sin. And therefore it must have been that this man had sinned and therefore he was blind. This is what the rabbis were teaching at the time. Now in one sense we know that the rabbis weren't wrong. All the troubles in the world are because of sin. It is due to sin in the world that there is sickness and suffering and ultimately death. It is because of Adam's and Eve's sin that sin entered the world. But the rabbis were mistaken in believing that a person's sin, a person's suffering, is a direct consequence of their own sin. Now we know, don't we, that we all suffer the consequence when we do things wrong. And there are consequences to some of the sins that we do. If we do not look after our bodies, if we eat and drink too much, we can become ill. But if we fail to exercise or get seek medical attention when we need it, we will suffer the consequences. If we steal, we may be punished. If we physically hurt somebody else, we may be punished. If we lie and cheat, we may get found out and be ostracised because of it. So there are direct consequences of our sin. But brothers and sisters, God does not punish us directly because of our sin. We all at times, I guess, try to look for the meanings of the tragedies in our lives, don't we? When we, we ourselves or a family member gets cancer or there's a car accident or there's a sick child or a broken relationship or financial difficulty. We find it all too easy to say who is to blame, who is responsible. We feel we need a culprit. But church, it's because we live in a fallen and sinful world where good behaviour is not always rewarded and bad behaviour is not always punished. Be clear, God did not choose the world to be like this. His design was perfect. A world without sin and suffering that it brings. But sin means that innocent people do suffer. God in his great power and wisdom sometimes chooses to take away our suffering and to heal us, to demonstrate his power as he did in this occasion with the blind man. But at other times when we call on him, Rather than removing the problem, he gives us the strength to endure it and to develop our Christian character. God is not always interested in our comfort, but he is interested in our development and in our Christian character. I guess if God always removed problems from our lives, we would worship him for comfort and convenience, not because of love and devotion. So let us be clear, God does not cause our suffering. That is a result of a fallen world. 
the church who does use our suffering for his will and purpose to demonstrate his hidden power to draw us closer to him to transform us into the people that he wants us to be regardless of the cause of our suffering Jesus has the power to help us deal with it so perhaps sometimes when we go through difficult times we should be asking God what is your will and purpose in this situation how do you want me to lean on you how do you want me to be strengthened by you what perspective do you want me to have through this difficulty that I'm facing in verse 3 Jesus answers the disciples question neither this man nor his parents sinned but this happened that the works of God might be displayed in him Today, this man's blindness was going to be used by God through Jesus as a miraculous sign of his power and authority. We read down throughout the New Testament many miracles of Jesus, and one of the most prevalent ones is healing and the healing of the blind. And this is actually predicted in Isaiah 29, verse 35, as a Mosaic gift. And so it is as Jesus demonstrates these miracles. He is giving another sign that he is God. In verse 6, six and 7 we read that Jesus spit on the ground and made some mud with the saliva, saliva and put it in the man's eyes and said, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. It was a deeply personal act, wasn't it? Which perhaps some of you may find slightly disgusting, that Jesus used his own saliva and mixed it with the earth. It's interesting, isn't it? It's the very substance used by God to create Adam in the first place. The earth of the ground. Jesus had a creator's understanding of the human body. He took the very material that God had used to make us combined it with his own saliva and put it on the man's eyes then instructed the man to go to the pool of Siloam so that his sight would be given now the pool of Siloam was built by King Hezekiah his workers had constructed a huge network of underground tunnels from the spring outside the city walls of Jerusalem which enabled water to be carried into the city so that the people of Jerusalem could always get water without fear of being attacked outside the city walls. This was obviously especially important in periods of siege that Jerusalem went through throughout its history. The pool would have been a fancy affair with four porches and its waters was used for various reasons from day-to-day -day drinking water through to sacred ceremonial use. Indeed, this very day that Jesus meets the blind man is the last day of the festival of tabernacles and the water would have been drawn from the pool of Siloam to be used in that ceremony and so it was, it had special significance on that very day. In 2004, archaeologists found the remains of the pool of Siloam that was there in Jesus' day. It lies to the south of Jerusalem on the ridge that Jerusalem is built upon. In a simple act of obedience then, this man, this blind man, in Bayesian instructions of a man he does not know, and goes and washes in the pool of Siloam. And then we read simply in verse 7, the man came home seeing. Now it's not recorded here, the amazement of the man, but can we imagine how this man felt? A man who had been born blind. What an incredible moment it must have been for him as he looked upon the city of Jerusalem for the first time 
able to see its sights and wonders, able to tie the noises and smells that he was familiar with to the picture that he could now see. To look at the beauty of nature, the sun, the sky, and his families and friends. It's almost impossible to imagine, isn't it, how this man felt in those few wet, simple words he came home seeing. Now, as a number of you know, in 2021 I suffered from severe COVID and I was hospitalised for 11 weeks. Five weeks of them on a ventilator, unconscious. My first recollection on coming round from being unconscious was that I could not see. My eyesight had significantly deteriorated. It was like I was looking through a neck curtain. Everything was hazy. I could no longer read or watch the television. You can imagine that was a scary time. Unbeknown to the doctors, I had tiny blood clots on the back of my eyes. And I'd also had a massive blood clot in my neck which they were treating me for with blood thinners. And unbeknownst to the doctors, they were treating my eye condition because they were treating the clot in my neck. And so it was. Over the following months, on two separate occasions, I woke up one morning, the second time, my eyesight fully restored, following the blood clots being dissolved in the back of my eyes. I have some small sense of what this blind man must have experienced. Some small sense of the delight of his words in verse 25. One thing I know, I was blind, but now I see. Night is coming, church. The powers of darkness are closing in for Jesus' death is not far away. But he still had time for this one act of compassion. Jesus, the light of the world, heals this man's eyesight, revealing the sun's light to him for the first time. But much more, Jesus opens this man's spiritual eyes to who he is, the Son of God. Let's turn to the reactions of the four groups of people then to this man's healing. Firstly, there are the man's neighbours who are divided and sceptical. Then there are the Pharisees who show disbelief and prejudice. Thirdly, there are the parents of the man who believe but they keep quiet because they fear being excommunicated. And lastly, there is the blind man himself who shows a consistent and growing faith. I would suggest to you that these are the reactions of people in the world today, so we have much to learn. So, firstly, the people. The people in the crowd who knew this man. They may have known him quite well, they may have lived with him for quite some period of time. They may have even indeed given him money yet they did not fully recognise him now that his life had been transformed by Jesus. Judaism is a very charity-based religion. It is important to give to the poor. So Jewish beggars would have often been quite well served, in fact better than their gentle counterparts. But begging was still considered to be a very humiliating profession. Beggars would have been looked down upon, not associated with. And perhaps it's not surprising then that the people, his neighbours, did not actually recognise him. Perhaps they'd never really looked at him. Perhaps they'd never really taken him in. Yes, they knew him as the blind man. But he was just there in the corner, sitting out of the way not to be associated with, not to be understood. 
He was just a beggar. But we know, don't we, that Jesus saw him. Jesus picked him out of the crowd. Jesus recognised him and his deep, his need. Perhaps also the blind man's physical appearance changed after his sight was restored. His face was open and bright, looking around. The relief of years of blindness removed from his face, able to communicate with the world around him and to interact, to work and earn a living again. No longer reliant on the charity of others. He was so transformed that his neighbours didn't really know if it was him or not. And so his neighbours questioned, is it really him? Is it really that our neighbour that was blind and that can now see? Some thought it was. But others were not convinced. But he himself insisted, I am the man. And they was going to question him, don't they? How is it that your eyes were open? And note straight away, this man becomes a witness to Jesus. He becomes a witness to the way that Jesus has transformed his life. He doesn't need a theological understanding of all that God has done. But he is able to witness to what he knows. I was blind, but now I can see. Jesus has transformed my life. I am that blind man. I can see. And so it is that he tells his story to his neighbours and friends. What a lesson to each one of us. We often think, don't we, we need to be, have a great theological knowledge to witness for Jesus, but we don't. All we need is to tell others what Jesus has done for us. How Jesus has changed our life. You know, it's easy, isn't it, for people to contradict us theologically, but nobody can contradict what Jesus has done for you because it's your personal story. The man goes on to explain what Jesus has asked him to do, to go out and wash in the pool of so long. And he goes and washes and he can see. His neighbours want to know where this man is, but the formerly blind man doesn't know. Jesus has left him. The blind man hasn't seen him. So he does not know. Second group of people that are recorded in this event are the Pharisees. Now we know that the Pharisees were the elite Jewish group. They had a strong focus on following the rules laid down by God in the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. But the Pharisees had gone far beyond what God had instructed. They had come up with their own list of rules to follow. Some 600 rules the Pharisees had in addition to what God originally gave on how they should live their lives. And it was these Pharisees that were seen as the arbiters of the truth. And so it was the neighbours brought the blind man to the Pharisees to be questioned. <coughs> Through the uh, Gospels we see, don't we, the Pharisees being in conflict with Jesus. On many occasions Jesus tries to reveal himself as the son of God to the Pharisees through using the word of God but on most occasions the Pharisees hearts are hardened Jesus criticizes the Pharisees for their insistence on earthly rules at the expense of love and compassion for each other and for the world the neighbors are Skeptical and divided, so they decide to bring this man to the Pharisees to rule on the matter. And the Pharisees question the man as to his story. It's interesting to note here that the Pharisees were divided themselves. One group of the Pharisees said that this man couldn't, it was impossible that this man was of God because he had healed on the Sabbath. This was breaking one of their man-made rules. Yet another group of the Pharisees said, well surely it must be from God, because who else could do such wonders? Who could else 
to perform such signs. So the Pharisees were divided as to the blind man's story. Then in a slightly bizarre twist of events, these supposedly learned scholars, these men that would proclaim to know all wisdom, turned to the man himself, this uneducated blind man, and asked for his opinion on the matter of who Jesus is. What do you have to say about the matter they say? The man simply replies in his own, the only language he knows, he is a prophet. Well, the Pharisees still didn't divide it, they decided to search for more evidence. So at this point, they called for the man's parents. In verse 19, we read that the Pharisees questioned the man's parents by saying, is this your son? Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that he can now see? The man's parents replied, we know he is our son and we know he was born blind. But how he can see now or who opened his eyes, we do not know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. Now the man's parents didn't want to directly disown him. So they're more than willing to confirm that he is their son who they've known since birth. And they're also willing to confirm that he is indeed born blind. They know that because they raised him and they've cared for him ever since. However, they're not prepared to put their neck on the line. They know that those that have not acknowledged Jesus as Messiah have already been cast out of the temple by the Jewish leaders and Pharisees, ostracised from the community, and they weren't prepared to take that risk. Hence, they say that they do not know who has healed Jesus, who has healed their son, the formerly blind man. If you read your ledger, verses 23 to 34, you will see the second encounter between the Pharisees and the blind man, where they go on to question him in an increasingly bitter encounter. The Pharisees try to use assaulting questions and their theology to poo-poo what the formerly blind man is saying about Jesus. Yet the blind man continues in his simple faith. He continues to acknowledge what Jesus has done in his life. He doesn't know what the Pharisees are talking about and their theology. He won't be bamboozled by them. He simply knows that Jesus has changed his life. He simply believes that this man must be from God. Who else could have healed his sight? And finally, the Pharisees, in a sign of their defeat, get angry with the formerly blind man, insult him, and throw him out of their presence. In verses 35 to 38, we witness the second encounter between Jesus and the formerly blind man. Jesus hears that the, blind man, the formerly blind man has been thrown out by the Pharisees and goes and seeks out for a second time the formerly blind man and says to him, do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man replies, tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus replies, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. What the man had known all along from his first meeting with Jesus is true. He is from God. He is a prophet. He is the Son of Man. The man exclaims, I believe. The man's neighbours were divided and sceptical. The Pharisees show shows division, disbelief and prejudice. His parents believed but, but kept quiet for fear of excommunication. The blind man believed and showed consistent and growing faith and a simple 
but strong witness. Church, this morning I pray that each one of us falls into the fourth group and is like the blind man, that we're not sceptical about the claims of Jesus, that we're not living in disbelief, that we're not keeping quiet because of fear of the consequences. What would we say if challenged? What have you to say about the matter? Who do you say Jesus is? It's important that we understand the theology of what we believe, so I would never say that studying the Bible is not important, it is. But remember from the life of this blind man that we don't know it all, need to know it all to be a good witness for Jesus. We don't need to know all the answers. We need to believe in Jesus. We need to have him as our personal saviour. But we can witness to him at any stage of our Christian walk because we can just tell others what Jesus has done for us. Brothers and sisters, a familiar story, but one I believe that has much to teach us today about how we should be witnessing for our Lord and Saviour. Amen. As we conclude our time together this morning, we're going to sing perhaps the obvious song to pick, but I picked it anyway. Amazing grace, I once was blind, but now I see. face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.